records Smell the cover, read all the verses Tell me about your favorites on vinyl and vision Hello and thank you for tuning into the latest episode of Vinyl and Vision. I am Jimmy Drab, your host, and this is my show, Welcome. My very special guest tonight is Taryn Fogarty. Um, Taryn Fogarty is a published writer, author, uh, poet, and, uh, and singer. Um, they are the singer for the band's uh, Lookers in Providence, which uh, I was able to, to see, and they blew me away. Um, during our talk, you might not get the impression that I am blown away by them or by, by Taryn, but I am, actually. I am a, a very big fan. I've actually really enjoyed their work, and um, I was just under the weather for this, uh, for this show, for the recording of this. I was actually hung over because it was the night after I did my last episode with Matt Trapp, and uh, yeah, I, I was not feeling great, but um, I was very excited to speak with them about Patti Smith's Horses, her 1975 debut album, which is great. Um, so we really get into it. It's, we get really in-depth into the record and a lot of facts and a lot of history and probably some of the best work I've done yet. And uh, so very, uh, very excited to, to speak with Taryn about, about that album and uh, about The Lookers, uh, the band in Providence, and as well as their book here, um, which is a very short chat book, uh, I was told. And, uh, yeah, I was able to read through it, and it's a very cool, interesting read. Um, it's published by Game Over Books. You can go to gameoverbooks.com. Uh, all links will be in the show notes, you know, uh, links to the Bandcamp for Looker's uh, EP Mirage, which I uh, purchased. There's no physical copy of it, unfortunately, right now. Uh, I believe the tapes have sold out, and there is no vinyl, so... You can only get the digital right now, but uh, I encourage you to do so. As a matter of fact, right now you are probably listening to a selection off of that EP. Um, at the end of the show, I will also be incorporating another song off that EP, if you stick around to listen for that. But, um, yeah, Tarot is great. It's great, great talk. Um, I guess uh, I'll just cut right to it and let you guys at the show. Um... Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, please do all the things you do with the internet. Like, share, subscribe. Um, do all those things. And uh, visit our, our website, please, where you can find this show, the audio and the video. You can find uh, all the things that I am selling. Uh, my record store is officially moving over to the website uh, solely. Uh, I am getting off of eBay and all that crap because it sucks. Uh, I have a website, so I need to utilize it. So if you're looking for some records, I am putting some stuff up right now. Um, slowly, I have over 200 plus, almost 300 things that I have to get up, so it's going to take me a little bit of time. Um, in addition to getting ready for other episodes of the podcast, which are coming very shortly. So, without further ado, do all those things and enjoy. I just wanted to say, uh, to say hi to you. Karen, and uh, thank you for doing this with me. Uh, I wanted to get a little- Thank you for having me. Of course, no, I, I um, so I discovered you through the band Lookers. Uh, I saw you, I saw the, the band playing uh, with Nova One at AS220 like last year. Yes, I remember that show so fondly. It was one of our last before quarantine. Right. Um, I believe that was a, a benefit for our friend Jackie James, who's in So Over It, uh, okay. if I'm remembering the right show. I, I, but, I was not familiar with who it was for. I just saw that it was for yeah. the show. So. Yes, it was a beautiful night. Lots of revelry. Um, yeah, and we haven't played a show <laughs> since then. Oh, but it's good to, good to uh, have that one in the memory bank. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, it was a great show. It was like really well, like populated. A bunch of people were there. They all seemed to be really loving it. And uh, I thought that Lookers yeah. was uh, an exceptionally like uh, captivating band. You know, like you guys really have a good stage presence. Um, and so, and I really liked the music too. And uh, you know, because I didn't know who you were, I didn't know anything about the band. I just kind of went because I wanted to go. I wanted to go see Noble One. 
And uh, yeah. yeah, I was blown away. It was great. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and I bought your EP. Um, is there any thing like, so with the quarantine having happened, are you, is Lookers like dissolving or are you guys kind of looking to get back together as soon as like you can? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our wonderful bassist, Florence, is, uh, you know, has family in the States, also family in England. And so it's been kind of going back and forth a bit throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, it's a band, it's five, six people sometimes. Um, but me and the other founder, uh, Rafa Rashid, we still, he's in my pod, <laughs> so we still hang out all the time. Um, and we're always kind of like polishing ideas and, and scheming for what the future could look like. So it feels sort of like, has been in like a teaming sort of developmental state all year. Um, just trying to make the most of the time and do some light songwriting and light demoing for when we can all get back. Oh. Um, together kind of right before <laughs> quarantine we were getting up like every week and had a bunch of new material coming so when we can't get back together there is stuff kind of half done that we're going to be working on and at that show we played I think two of the newer songs we were working on oh, okay so you know really excited for when things kind of shift in our landscape a little bit and right. we're able to all hang out again because so much happens when you can get everybody in the room together um it's cool to talk to you here but i haven't done a, a bunch of zoom or, or virtual things I sort of I, I struggle with it a little bit me too i, I don't really like yeah. it, but i prefer to have people here i like that because i like to kind of get hands on with the person and, and get uh, hands on the vinyl actually especially like do you actually own a vinyl copy of this record I do. Okay. I have I have several of Patti Smith's records. Um, I'm like a I'm a big vinyl nerd at this point. Yeah. Good. It's a well, lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, uh, I would love to have you here because I'd love to actually be able to play the record. Like that's what we do. It's like I we have the turntable in, in here in the room, and we actually put the record on, and we'll uh, go listen to portions of it. But we we can do it digitally, and you know, I got the the music here on the computer, so we'll be able to, to hear it. Cool. I'm happy to try it out this way. Yeah, yeah, I am too, actually. This is my first time actually being able to fuse the music in and actually have you participate with it, which is, which is going to be good. So um, cool. back to your, your band, Lookers. Uh, I realized that it's kind of like a super group, huh? Like, uh, so you already mentioned <laughs> yeah. Ray, who is uh, from Ravi Shavi. Uh, yes. Florence was from Low Anthem. And who were the other members of the band? I think they're members of Ravi Shavi. Is that correct? Yes. So um, the lineup has changed uh, slightly. Um, I mean, we started doing this in 2016. Um, okay. So it's, it's been a little while now. Uh, yeah. I would say me and Rafe are the founders. Um, Nick Palatelli plays guitar. Um, at the time, Brian Fielding was playing drums, and all three of those guys are from Ravi Shavi and also have their own solo uh, projects as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also brought in our friend Talia to do some drumming and some like techie stuff, and that's kind of what we were playing with before going on the break. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh... yeah. and then you know I'm coming from. Uh, not a, really a music background. I used to do a lot of spoken word poetry um, mm. and coming from more of like a writing and performance background uh, and sort of learning how to front a band and, you know, kind of started that process with them all. I used to, um, in like the earlier days of Ravi Shavi, do backup vocals for them at shows. So that's kind of how we all came together and started making our own music with my my lyrics and singing at the front yeah oh, okay yeah let's get into the record patty smith horses so uh this record was released in uh 
November 10th. 75? 1975, correct. Uh, recorded fairly quickly too, like from August to September 18th at Electric Lady Studios in New York City. Um, the thing that stands out most to me about this is how rock and roll Patti Smith is. As we like go through the songs, you're gonna read like, maybe you do, maybe you know this, maybe you don't know this, but uh, she is so like connected to rock and roll. And this, this record specifically is almost like an, like an homage to rock and roll. Is that like, what are your yeah. thoughts on this record? This was like a game changing experience for me. Yeah. And when, I have a whole, when, I have a whole spiel. <laughs> let me hear it. Can you hear it? Yeah, yeah. Well, right. when, when did so, you introduce this record? I was a freshman in high school. Okay. And is that? I don't, I don't know um, how, oh God, 2000, 2003 or four. Okay. Um, and I was just starting Catholic school. <laughs> I, I went to LaSalle Academy in Providence. Um, okay. But I, you know, I'd been in public school all up until that point. So it was a little bit of, I'm not Catholic. So it was a little bit of a, a not quite a culture shock, but I was just like, oh, okay. Hmm. So I'm like in my little school uniform, like adjusting. Uh, oh. And I would go hang out on Thayer Street in Providence. And I would go into a place that was called Tom's Tracks. I don't know if, if <laughs> you're from Providence or like have any... Memory of that place. Um, yeah, fond memories. Of cool. That. Yeah. So I was just a little moody teenager up in Tom's tracks, um, and right next to each other was Horses and then Dirty by Sonic Youth, hmm. and both just have like really interesting covers. And I was sort of into some Riot Girl and and some things at that time, and so I sort of recognized her name. Um, and just like thought it was such a beautiful picture. And I was just like, oh, like Patti Smith, like I've heard of her before. And I just bought both CDs just out of curiosity. Um, and they both ended up just being like two of my favorite things of time and mm. really influential. But uh, I just remember like getting home and, and putting it in my CD player and just the way it starts. And it's like a vivid memory of mine. Yeah, I don't have wonderful memory, but, <laughs> but that memory is really vivid. Yeah. Of just hearing her voice for the first time and hearing those opening chords and being like, what? who is she? What is this? Right. It's so fun, but heavy and, and poetic and strange. And, you know, I was just starting to write, um, you know, keep my own journals and write my own like poetry. I didn't really know what I was what to call it, but you know, I was, I was a writer hmm. and it, it just was like, pew, it was just this huge relationship just started right away. Yeah. Yeah. So our, you were only dabbling with writing at that point being a 14, 15 year old, year old, I think, for freshman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the summer beforehand, one of my aunties gave me a copy of, uh, I think it's called Pieces of Me by Jewel. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah. yeah. Um, and I got really into that. And so I started writing my own words uh, to like the progressions and melodies of these like jewel songs. <laughs> mm. oh. Just just started doing that and didn't really think to it too much. But that's kind of where I was at. It's like, oh, yeah, like I write a little bit too. Like I like music too. Um, <laughs> yeah. So then you know? <laughs> how did you get involved in making music? I mean, because so, so, I mean, obviously, you know, you started writing poetry, you start uh, obviously getting into uh, poetry slams, like kind of uh, poetry performance, uh, spoken word, Big I time. guess. And yeah. um, so where does music show up in, in that format for you? Mostly, I mean, throughout my teenage years, just as uh, a fan, you know, Right. Like I, I started getting positive attention for my poetry pretty quickly. Um, Cause in that same time period, a friend took me to AS220. 
uh, to the Providence Poetry Slam, which, you know, I'm still involved with. Mm -hmm. And it was just a huge uh, developmental space for me. But so like, you know, uh, writing and, and reading poetry was kind of all I was interested in for most of my teenage years, pretty much because I was being celebrated for that. And mm. it was where I was socializing and, and you know, forming an identity, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, sometimes like, you know, if a friend had a little band, played guitar or something, we would like, you know, I would sing a little, little bit or like write a song but it wasn't something I was actively pursuing for myself. I was kind of like the poet and was like embracing that um, very much as a young person. Yeah, that's cool. And so you were, yeah. you were never in any other bands prior to Lookers? No. Cool. No, that's my other, other than, you know, like I said, doing some backup vocals here and there or like, you know, lending my, my skills, so to speak, to a songwriting process, some of my friends. Um, yeah, it just, I always wanted to, but I think I was a little bit shy to it or just, you know, really pouring most of my energy into the, the slam scene that was here. Mm. Cool, yeah, um, so a lot of parallels between you and Patti Smith, actually. Um, yeah. So this started, <laughs> she was also uh, kind of a developing writer uh, she actually did some, uh, she had some poetry published by this point before starting the band and uh, actually was also a uh, rock critic writer for a very brief period. She kind of wanted to explore, uh, you know, the spoken word and the poetry aspect of, you know, melding it, melding it with music. So how did, like, without any experience being in a band, without being like a experienced singer or having done it before, where... Where did you get that that gumption to kind of do that and kind of you know go all in with with the lookers? Well, I guess from having some success as a spoken word artist, I was comfortable on stage, mm. um, and you know I hosted a lot of shows. I would you know I just did poetry shows up and down the East Coast uh, and would go to these big national competitions and I liked being on stage, you know, I liked the performance aspect of it. Um, and since I do love singing and love music, I would incorporate uh, singing a lot into my, my features and different things I was doing with, with the poems. Um, it started just the more I would sing and the more I would, you know, book shows and kind of open or close with songs that I had written a cappella. I just started getting a lot of love for that. Um, and by the time I went to college, within the first few months of being there, I met uh, Rafe, who is the co-founder of, of Lookers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he was just very encouraging. Um, and like I said, kind of brought me into Ravi Shavi in different periods. And by the time we were both kind of back, we were in New York at the time. So the, by the time we were both back in uh, Providence, it just sort of naturally uh, started happening that we would hang out and kind of be writing songs. And they were just coming out really good. So we were like, all right, Nick, all right, Brian, all right. Like everybody want to do a side project? Does that sound fun? Hmm. Um, and it was just really organic thing. Uh, but yeah, I guess it just took, I mean, there's so many parallels, like Patti Smith is someone I look up to and who just has an incredible career where she's able to kind of dabble in every, everything she's interested in um, and make her, her place and develop her voice in those things, you know? You know, she does whatever she wants to do. Um, and I, I feel like I'm a similar person where I just have a lot of interests, but they're all sort of serving a certain idea and a certain vision. Right. Um, and when you meet the collaborators of your dreams, you pursue that. And so she has that kind of relationship with Lenny Kay, who plays guitar and bass um, on a lot of her projects. Yeah, I mean, I think Lenny Kay, I mean, like, I think he's the programming yeah. songwriter with the band. 
And uh, I know that like the first release they had prior to versus coming out was um, was a single that they actually self produced, uh, cover of Hey Jimmy Hendrix, uh, Hey Joe, and uh, the B side of Piss Factory. Yeah, and, Piss yeah, Factory. Whoa, I haven't thought about that in a long time. Yeah, that was their first release, and uh, and they they self produced yeah. it. And uh, so I, I think yeah. that Lenny K is uh, credited as producing that like those songs. So uh, here, let's uh, listen to Gloria a little bit. Let's end it right there. People say beware. Good question. I like that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that, that's the opening to Gloria. Um, most of some of the words that are used in, in this version uh, of the cover of Gloria done by the band Them, uh, written by Van Morrison, I believe, um, it was taken from a, a poem originally that she had written uh, called Oath. But yeah, basically she had taken parts of that poem and, and infused it into this song. Are you familiar with the, uh, the Them version uh, of Gloria? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, God, there's so many versions of Gloria. At, at some point, a precedent was set that you have to kind of interject your own attitude into your cover of Gloria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that's, that sounds about right. Um, yeah, and they, they do that. Like, so this and maybe she, maybe she set that precedent. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure who the first band was to cover Gloria, but it definitely has grown to be like that. Like just like almost a rite of passage as a rock band. It's just like, well, you got to cover at least a portion of Gloria and make it your own. This gives you this like, it's just so so much swagger um, and so much rebellion and, and all the beautiful things we love about rock and roll and about early punk, especially. And to hear it, be called punk rock I was like wait it totally is though it's so it has that attitude and that swagger yeah well you know prior to the, that this was released in 75 so this is actually predates the Ramones so as far as like punk history is concerned I mean this actually is at the forefront of that whole movement we're going to get into uh, Redondo Beach you ready oh yeah Redondo Beach little bit of history on this no, song. It, it, she wrote it when she, after having this argument with her sister and the lyrical content seems kind of strange, doesn't it? Because it's kind of like a, this weird love story-ish. It, it seems yeah. like, so yeah, this song has a bunch of weird connotations uh, to, to lesbianism, to, uh, and then to this, this suicide of this person's lover and yeah. their body shows up, washes up on the shore. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's crazy, crazy lyrically speaking. Yeah, totally. Um, about the song and it being about her sister, but her also reading some kind of news story. Mm -hmm. um, and for a moment, sort of darkly fantasizing, like, oh, what if this body that washed up was my sister who I just fought with. And that was like the last yeah. thing we talked about. And I think, I think that's maybe a piece of it. Um, or I'm just totally making that up. No, that's not. <laughs> I right. feel like that might be kind of where that, that, that sort of dark thought, um, which I think is relatable, frankly. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. See, I think that now it's strange because so the research that I did on this record like I got basically a uh, synopsis of like what every song is about and like kind of like how it came to be. Of all of those interpretations that I've read about and, and this, you know, the, the synopsis of the, the content, there's so much more going on lyrically. Like there's so much more different like nuances and tales that she weaves in, which seem like it's part of her personal life as well as like fi completely fictionalized, like just fantasy stories. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're going to see that a lot, I think. So, uh, it's, <laughs> and, and it's fitting because, you know, poetry basically is, is supposed to be up to interpretation, correct? I mean, like, like all writing, really. Do you like that it's this open-ended thing where anyone that's reading your work can kind of just take whatever they want out of it? And it's like, it's not like they have to kind of get the point of what you were getting at. Oh, sure. Yeah, I think, um, 
a lot of writers like kind of concern themselves with tapping into sort of universal experience through personal detail and somehow kind of like meshing those experiences so that I can get uh, a type of catharsis perhaps from like expounding upon my own experiences, but maybe they touch you as well. Um, and that is where that like connection between reader and, and, and speaker, so to speak, happens. Um, and Redondo Beach is a cool example of that because I, I'm thinking of that lyric when she talks about apple blonde hair, yeah. you know? So I feel like she has this fight with the sister, reads an article, there's a body washed up on the beach, apple blonde hair, oh, my sister has apple blonde hair. Let me like panic for a moment. Hmm. Um, and in that panic, I zoom out and fantasize that this is my life and that I'm rolling up to the beach to claim the body and everybody's so sad. Mm -hmm. You know, I went looking for you. Um, it, it's, it's beautiful and, and it kind of, it's very cinematic, but it is coming out of this kind of universal feeling of something like that happening. You, you see a headline on the nightly news like, oh, someone got in a car crash, they were this age, and you're like, oh my God, it's my brother. Right. You know, <laughs> and we all just kind of instinctively uh, insert ourselves into, into the narratives that we experience in the world. Hmm. Um, and so I, I feel like she's kind of doing that while also showing how that's done, so to speak. Yeah. I like it. So it's kind of this like a, a process of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's really mm -hmm. interesting stuff. Yeah. And, you know, a, a, another thing kind of sticking out to me is, again, kind of returning to this idea of like what punk music is. And I know for me, when I was first hearing this album, punk music was like, we're going to just kind of very directly talk about this one kind of political experience mm -hmm. in this short, quick, fast way. And here is another flavor of punk that is like narrative poetic, really expositional, um, but also fictional. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting stuff. Hmm. Cool. So uh, I don't know, it's very, it's a very strange album. I, I have to admit to you actually, you know, I never really liked this album. Like, um, yeah. and I actually went out and bought it and listened to it. And I was just like, eh, I don't really, like, I don't get it. <laughs> like, but now actually having listened to this, I can certainly see the, uh, like, like the aspects about it, the, the good aspects about it and like why it is so groundbreaking in so many ways and why and how like amazing Patti Smith is as an artist. Yeah. That's great. So let's- uh, Yeah, let's I mean, um, I don't, yeah, that's really interesting. Cause I know part of the draw for me is very much about, you know, the interests I had coming into it as a young person, but also, you know, you can't have this conversation without talking about gender. You just can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, to, to see that album cover, you know, I'm non-binary, I'm a gender fluid person. Mm -hmm. To see someone, to see this thing and it's like, oh my God, it's 1975, here's this person like oh. in suspenders, obviously playing with gender roles or your presentation, you know, I'll say. But also that, here's like a woman at the front of this band who's not pop um, and she's not singing beautifully and she's right. just using her own voice in all these really interesting ways, but like, you know, isn't like a singer in the way that we, I think often expect a lot of, at least before her and like of her time for them to look and for them to sound. Right. Um, so that's like all really intriguing stuff too that That's I think part. adds to like the magnetism of it for me, of why yep. I was so drawn to it. So uh, let's move on. We're gonna get onto uh, Birdland. Ah. This one's cool. Mm -hmm. Saw his daddy. <laughs> Thoughts on Birdland? Mine? Well, okay, let me, let me, let me give you the facts <laughs> first. Okay, so Birdland uh, is a, uh, so it's a fictional account of Peter Reich's son encountering his father flying in a spaceship after his death. I guess it's shortly after the funeral and he sees his father, the supposedly an image of his father in this flying saucer and 
wants to go with him and, you know, uh, asks him to, to pick him up and take him up. So do you believe in intelligent life? That's a good um, <laughs> whoa. Uh, honestly, a friend of mine has gotten me into some really amazing paranormal podcasts. Oh yeah. And I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> I think, I think why not? There's so many other wild things in life. Yeah, just getting flying across the the galaxy and the <laughs> amazing. I love be- that question. That really took me off. <laughs> yeah, trying to to branch out, not to be too serious, you know. Um, <laughs> this the song is silly. The song is fucking silly, isn't it? Yeah, totally. So yeah, so so give me uh, give me a little bit about your your interpretation of the song. Like, what what does this song do for you? You know, in the in the poetry world, we would call this a persona piece where mm. you just step in to an existing uh, object or character or situation yeah. um, and just try to wear those shoes and explore how it would feel um, to experience that. But it also makes me think of uh, how much of kind of a fangirl she is of what she's into and how it like incorporates into what she makes so much. Um, You know, she's constantly talking about the poet William Blake, constantly talking about Rimbaud, constantly talking about um, soul music and artists that she she danced to growing up as a kid. Mm -hmm. And just like always is marrying those things. Um, And so I see kind of Birdland as an extension of that practice of always kind of uh, giving a nod to your influences. You you nailed it because uh, the only other thing about this song, kudos, <laughs> kudos. The only other thing about this song is that um, so Birdland itself, the title is basically taken from uh, the Chubby Checker song. I'm familiar with the artist, but I, I can't say that I could. I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me play. You got it. Song. You're gonna play it. Let me play a little bit of it for you. Okay. Because <laughs> I was interested, like when I heard that, you know, just like I was saying before, this album is an homage to rock and roll, you know? And so like you had said, that's like, you know, she, she uh, incorporates these aspects of her life, like this music that she, she loved as a child and danced to, and it all shows in this album. So here is Chubby Checker's Birdland. Yeah, it's right there, huh? It's right there. I, I saw that it was weird, so listening to the song without that context, I was just like, why, does they, why don't they end the song saying, we like Birdland? I was just like, wait, is this the club? Is this, what, what is Birdland? <laughs> yeah, right. What does Birdland have to do with, you know, being an alien abduction? <laughs> yeah, I, that's, that's amazing. Cause I always just figured it was like a kind of a artsy fartsy poetic moment of like, oh, the sky, mm. Birdland. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just thought, I just assumed. Right. It was like artistic uh, license or something right there. But that's really cool. It turns out that it's her sprinkling these things in, in the record. And there's a lot of yeah. them, actually. So um, let's get back to that record. And the next song is great, Free Money. Hey. Who doesn't like free money? <laughs> Waiting for my stimmy. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, well, that's a whole other story. We'll get into that later. <laughs> I know it's getting good right oh, there. Oh, baby. Stopping it right at the good moment. <laughs> so now you you queued up that that exact line that i actually wanted to focus on um there's a line in that song that we had just listened to that said i know they're stolen but i don't feel bad now what i have a question for you um this is stolen this is a stolen question it comes from a game that my kids got for christmas <laughs> okay <Called Our Moment. laughs> It's called Our Moments and it's the kids version. But I heard this question and I thought this was so fitting. Uh, if someone you loved was very sick but could not afford the medicine to, be, to get better, would it be okay to steal the medicine? Under capitalism, baby, I think it's okay to steal most things, <laughs> especially if you're at Walmart or some major kind of store like that. Yeah. I don't care. I really don't care. Yeah. 
You, you don't find a moral dilemma in that, like the, the idea of stealing? Even no, I think the fact that none of us have uh, health care is a moral dilemma. Mm, it's true. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. In which case, yeah, of course, of course, why not steal it? Because we can't afford it and we can't, and it's not being offered to us, really. Yep. Cool. And I pay my taxes. True. Me too. Way too many. So, way, too many. way too many. Way too many. So steal what you can. Who cares? I'm literally about to get in my car tomorrow morning and drive my extra inhaler to someone I met on Twitter who's having asthma attacks and they can't get access to their albuterol. So like, that's where we're at. Right. And that's what I'm about. Like, I, I don't care. Wow. Well, okay, so we always, you're living this question right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, that's definitely an admirable thing, and uh, I, I appreciate you doing that. That sounds like a great thing to do. I mean, what, what the hell, you know? Like, uh, it's called mutual aid. We, we all have to be about it, especially uh, right now, but forever. Yeah. Um, and if someone out there in Providence is like, hey, I don't have access to this thing, and I have one lying around, like, you know, anybody should do that. Right. Well, I, I hope that they do. And I hope that uh, anyone listening will, will take that to heart. Me too. Now, uh, you said you were born and raised in Rhode Island. Uh, you went to school in New York City, uh, the new school, correct? I did, yeah. Um, so why did you not stay in New York? Because I love Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> I love it so much. Yeah. And uh, I stuck around in New York for a little bit. I also, you know, I love New York City. Oh, my God. I miss it so much. Yeah. A city I have a lot of love for. Um, but this is, I don't know. I love Providence. I love Rhode Island. I love being from here. It just, like, feels good to be of a place. Um, yeah. How do I say this? It's like, you know, you, you, you try to have a a relationship and identity to place that also acknowledges kind of like settler colonialism and, you know, oh. uh, so as much as I, I embrace it to that extent where like, yes, I grew up here, towny stuff, but there's, you know, also so many kind of like, it's maybe a larger conversation than uh, talking about horses by Patti Smith. But I just think she, she rocks a certain um, class consciousness and a, a pride that um, I just find really beautiful. Mm. Yeah, but I, I just love the community here so much. Um, and I just get a lot of love here for the, the things I do and the stuff I make. And, you know, I wanted to come home and, and, and work with, the poets at Providence Poetry Slam. I thought they were, they are, and and were at the time, especially like doing the coolest things. Mm -hmm. uh, not even just in like slam, which is just the means to an end, but some of the most talented writers. Um, and the music scene here is incredible. Like there was just no reason to not come home and drink this up too with like equal fervor. Mm. That's yeah. great. I, I, do, yeah. And I, I do, I do love the state. I do. Um, I do have a profound respect for what's happening in this state for the most part, uh, at least arts wise. And yeah, <laughs> and yeah I, I mean, I have to completely agree with you. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Oh, I love the song. It's so, it's so funny to um, listen in snippets like this. <laughs> no, right? It's funny. Um, I love this song though. I feel like, I don't know. I don't quite know the timeline of David Bowie, but something about the guitar on this song feels very like, <laughs> very Bowie to me in a cool way. Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, so this, this song plays right into the whole thing about the, the rock and roll uh, homage. Um, so in, in the version of this that I listened to, actually, you know what, I'm gonna put it on for you. The second disc of this on, and the reissue from 2005, this is the way the song starts. So you got that right? Yeah. So that, that that's really cool. I never heard that. Yeah, that's that's the song in a nutshell. You know, it's just like it's basically a song based on a dream that she had about you know uh, Jim Morrison, who had already been already already died by this point, and uh, you know she sees him with like these angel wings that are like locked in 
melded into some marble that she has to break up to free him. So it's that's that's so. Uh, thank you for playing that. I've never heard that before. Um, it's really beautiful. Yeah. But it it makes me think again about um, about William Blake again. I don't know if you're familiar with any of uh, his poems. I am not really. But um, that's okay. It, it just like has to do a lot with uh, how do I say it? like sublimity, you know? So like it, it's kind of in the the zone of like religious ecstasy. Um, yeah, uh, without getting like too heady, but I'm not surprised to hear this kind of poem slash explanation from Patti Smith about this song because it's very much like in that vein of like kind of like religious like beholding an angel and having this almost like out of body orgasmic sort of like experience mm. that feels like a dream but you know and there's a lot of stuff like that in in that sort of um school of, of poetry that William Blake is in and I see her kind of like bringing in that mm. uh funky influence and, and doing her spin on it and making it about like a rock god instead of actual religious uh, <laughs> iconography and kind of like hodgepodging those influences together is, is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, um, so yeah, that, that's basically it, that song, as far as what it means and where it came from. The next song is a little interesting and it's a little difficult to understand. Uh, land. <clears throat> It's simply called Land, but it's kind of like it's got three subtitles. Horses, Land of a Thousand Dances, and La Mer de. All right, we'll leave it at mashed potato. You, you heard that part, that do the twist, that high-pitched squeal thing that she does? Yeah. Totally. And, it, you know, um, I was thinking I couldn't, you know, sometimes I just sit and I listen to album so I don't always know the names of songs even if I know every single word right <laughs> and so earlier right so earlier when we were talking about the uh you know bringing in influences yeah. um which I guess we've been talking about the whole show but mm -hmm. this is her you know kind of Chuck Berry moment where you know the piano starts going and it's all about the mashed potato and like all this like evocative stuff um but also coming out of this narrative where some kid's head gets just bashed into a locker and he's like seeing the little cartoon birds fly around his head and he goes into this like rock and roll fantasy and it's really it's like so much fun yeah is that, is that how you take it okay because that's how i um, take it yeah because this song is so weird okay so again another homage to the music that she loves so she incorporates all of these like kind of classic rock stuff that she grew up with and, and this is one of those it's uh you know land of a thousand dances and you can hear it right as it kicks in there she could, does the whole thing like naming all of these songs naming all these dance styles and stuff stuff like that um the last part is uh la mer de um which i guess was a french word for shit right oh yeah. that yeah Mierde. right so it's la mer and then it's her own little play on that word and calling it Mer, mer, merd, merd. I don't know how you pronounce it. I'm not French. Um, my take is that I believe. Oh, so I'm looking. <laughs> um, I'm looking up nicknames for heroin because I think what I had heard. Fun. That, well, yeah. If you're into that, <laughs> sure. Um, um, I, I thought I heard that a nickname for heroin was was horse. Is that Ooh. correct? I'm trying to find that right now. But um, I don't know. Well, because so basically the uh, yeah, of course. OK, that's a one one slang term for, for heroin. So I think I, my interpretation is that it's possibly like a drug reference. Uh, Johnny is possibly an addict. Uh, it sounds kind of like in the beginning of the song, like there's some kind of like maybe altercation, possibly with a dealer or um, or just some rival gang person, something or other where they jump this guy for whatever, whatever he's got. Um, and then the song goes into the land of a thousand dances. And then near the end, um, how does it end? Let me see, let me see if I can, it, it, it drags. It's kind of, I feel like this song is almost like uh, the Velvet Underground's 
uh, heroin song. Hmm. Because that song is so, so great at capturing like the essence of being on heroin, right? So it's got the, it starts really slow and quiet, just like this does. And then it builds up into the, what I would imagine is the exciting part of doing heroin. And then it, it kind of falls back down. It goes in these peaks and valleys, you know? And I think that this yeah. song looks in that same way. It kind of builds up into, uh, into a climax and then comes back down at the very end where it even literally ends with just a simple drum beat, like just really quiet. Mm. Let me see if I can hear that. Yeah, so it, it just basically ends like that. And, it, and, and so it sounds to me like it's someone coming down or something from. Yeah, as far as what I can imagine she was seeing around her at the time, the way she would want to reflect what was happening around her at the time and empathize and experience and, you know, uh, it, it sounds like a spot on analysis. Mm. Um, and I, I really didn't know that about the, the slang of it all, but it really fits. Um, and yeah, I think has just an extra layer of, of depth than that original analysis I was offering. Mm. I mean, especially as a, an artist like this, who is always kind of referencing and hinting at things and, and bringing in a lot of outside um, into the work seems right. pretty spot on. All right, well, let's get into the last song, Elegy. Okay. All right. That's about enough of that song. It's, so, a, it's a sad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, really. So now, <laughs> back story about this song, which makes it even more sad, is that, again, the homage to rock and roll, this song was recorded at Electric Lady Studios, which was Jimi Hendrix's recording studio. Yeah. And it was recorded on the anniversary of his death, five years, mm. the fifth year anniversary. Um, and the song actually is uh, written as in homage to Jimi Hendrix. So um, yeah. pretty amazing experience for her to be able to kind of <laughs> take that opportunity to be in the studio that he made, that he, like, he, he built himself like to record his own music. On, yeah and to be in that room on the day of the anniversary of his death, and then to record this yeah. song. Um, one, just the one thing I have about the song was that uh, there's actually even lyrics at the very end, which were taken from Jimi Hendrix's song 1983, A Merman I Wish to Be, which is actually one of my favorite Jimi Hendrix songs of all time. Uh, <laughs> at the very end, it's, a, it's, it's much too bad that our friends can't be with us today. It just shows you like how, devastating it must have been to have kind of, you know, gone through the 60s and all of its highs and lows. Um, and then for the early 70s to kind of kick in and all this drug abuse and all this chaos and just the whole movement kind of taking this ugly turn and a lot of people dying. Um, and it just leaving this kind of like devastating imprint um, on the arts community at large. Uh, mm. And it, yeah, it just has me thinking that like, oh yeah, like punk overall is kind of a response to that, but especially like this, this album, it's like you're coming into New York, you're coming into these scenes while it's being like totally ravaged by this like dead dream of the sixties right. uh, and so many people overdosing and just having a rough go of it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. tons yeah. of artists just dying in those four or five years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I didn't think about that. Um, I think that Gimme Shelter and that that show, the show at Altamont that the Stones did, was is kind of regarded as like the the death of the free love movement and like the death of what he did. And, you know, I had heard that before, too, but sitting and watching it, it makes you see why. Like, that shit looks like a, like a circle of hell. Like, it just looks right. like an awful place to be. There's just naked people having terrible trips. There's tons of violence from the Hells Angels that hate hippies. Right. You know, there's, like, naked babies running around. Like, where are their parents? There's dogs. Like, it just looks like a circle of hell. <laughs> <laughs> and they just wanted to give a nice free concert. And you're like, okay. We can't have nice things. Like it's just rough. Yeah, 
but yeah, but Patti Smith loves rock and roll music. And I think that that's basically how this album ends is just her having this little elegy for the people that she loves that have, that have, uh, that have left us, you know, um, rock and roll people, especially, you know, there's like, there's the Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Janis Joplin. Um, in the new version of this that she does with the 2005 version, when she performs it live, she also incorporates the people that she has personally left or lost recently, like uh, Todd Smith, her, her brother, uh, Fred Sonic Smith, her husband, and uh, Robert Maplethorpe are mentioned in there. So it's very, yeah, it's just a touching song. I guess it's a good way to wrap it up. But um, well, I want to talk, just end this uh, talking about you a little bit. Uh, like I said, I ordered your book and it has not come in. Thank you for ordering it. That's awesome. I, I would love uh, to hear your thoughts. Sure. As soon as I can get my hands on it, I, I will let you yeah. know. But, um, but with that being said, I mean, I don't, I can't talk, I can't speak of it because I had, a, I don't have it. But for anyone else that might be interested in it, like what, what is your take on it? Like, what can you tell me? Like, what can I expect when I get it? Um, let's see. Well, it's called Sex Camel. Yeah. Um, Evocative title, I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I guess a lot of my work in poetry pretty pointedly is about being a queer survivor of sexual assault. And so this is a very short book that kind of marks a journey um, of kind of finding oneself and finding love a bit again in those contexts. Uh, but I think it's like a funny book too. Yeah. So I know that sounds like really heavy to get into, but I don't think people come out of reading it in a super bogged down, like heavy space, but mm. it's just, um, so I guess the, the allegory is like, I am sex camel. I am moving through the desert, so to speak. Um, and it's about not having sex for a long time and then having sex <laughs> like, with all that context in there. Um, so it's kind of a, a fun, sexy, very kind of raw, real book. I think that's the yeah. goal. <laughs> right. it's all poems, it's all a collection of poems, correct? Or... Yes, yes. It's a, I guess technically it's a chat book. So it's a bit shorter than what a full collection would be. Um, and it's just kind of telling that one story. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Well, I'm yeah, I, I, think, I think we've covered it all. How do you feel? I feel great. I can't thank you enough. It's been so nice just to, to gab like this. Um, and I, I appreciate your, your research. And I feel like I learned so many wonderful things about uh, this album I really care about and love so much. So thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. It's been my, it's been my pleasure. And uh, like I said, this, when we spoke on Wednesday briefly, I, <laughs> this is the most prepared I've ever been. It's not like this for me. I'm, <laughs> I am very loose. I'm just like, come on in. Let's put the record on. Let's listen to it and chat. Let's talk about it. But yeah, uh, I hope I hope I can come back someday and maybe come sit in your shack. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. If you want to talk about another record with them, yeah. Or if you have a awesome. new one comes out, like the new Wizard album comes out or anything. Yeah. Ooh, that might be yeah. a good. Ooh, interesting. All right. Well, we'll be in touch. <laughs> All right, Taryn, well, hey, it was a pleasure talking with you and, uh, and getting to know you a little bit better. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much see again. Hope to see you out there in the real world. Uh, one of these days. It'll be a beautiful day. Yeah.